The historic route through the north of Ethiopia begins with the ancient churches and monasteries on Lake Tana. Tropical vegetation covers the volcanic cone that protrudes like an island from the largest inland lake of the Ethiopian highlands. Dega Stefanos lies in the middle of the lake and contains one of the country's most important monasteries. In a small sanctuary, various mummies are preserved in glazed wooden coffins. Here, the remains of five emperors of various dynasties lie at rest. Today, only a few monks live here. Dek is the largest island and can be seen in the distance. Two water towers and a bell tower of typical Gondar design protect the Naga Selassie church. 24 stone-like pillars that support a large roof adorn the outer ring of a path that leads around the church. The magnificent murals in the interior of the rotunda are among the most beautiful and most well-preserved of those that are known as of second Gondar design. There is no altar, just a shrine, the Machdas, that is surrounded by painted walls, the motifs of which were often depicted as what could be called comic strips. Bible stories are told, and the Trinity is surrounded by purgatory to the journey to heaven. People celebrate outside the church. By boat, we travel to the south of Lake Tana, to the Zegi Peninsula, a romantic natural landscape, a splendid place where once politicians met. A narrow path leads through the coffee and geisho bushes to a hill within the monastery area, at the center of which is the impressive monastery fort. Here, treasures were also protected, such as books and crosses. The history of the Hidden Island Monastery is long, and most notably includes the hostilities of the Oromo tribe in the land of Shur. There, the emperor's fort was taken piece by piece from Shur back to the islands of Lake Tana, and the monastery experienced a new prosperity and became the seat of government. Close by to the south is the small island of Kebran, a plaque by the entrance gate indicates that females are not permitted to enter the monastery. This small monastery is one of the oldest in Ethiopia. Here in 1350, Abazar Johannes of Shur settled and was eventually buried here. One of the towers secured crowns, crosses and books. Papyrus thickets surround the island monastery of Debre Mariam, a small, inconspicuous church. This was once part of a monastery under Emperor Amdas Sion, and Emperor Iyasu I decreed that a religious council should be held here. The local people of Wayoto still use papyrus boats and live here as in the past. Here ends the first part of our journey. The route leads northwards through a land of contrasts, a country with a colorful past and a rich religious history. Everywhere there is a simple way of life, indescribable poverty, at least in the eyes of the civilized world.
But Ethiopia is a country that is also rich in culture and an unusual background for myths and legends. It's a land where the earth touches the sky. Here has been preserved a millennium ancient South Arabian and Christian influenced culture like nowhere else in the world. Priceless relics of a once powerful, ancient and religious civilization are set in a breathtaking landscape. Mountains, canyons and nature reserves. And everywhere there are people walking along the roads, a constant coming and going, a mosaic of ethnic groups, languages and dialects. Slowly, the suburbs of Gondar emerge. The streets become wider and stone buildings line the road. An old imperial city, Gondar is one of the country's great centers of religion. Gondar, a city of palaces and castles. Ethiopia in the 17th century. For the first time in the country's history, King Phasaelidas began with the construction of a walled palace. Until then, the emperors of that time took part in various campaigns during the dry season. Only during the rainy season was the court located in a camp. So within the course of a century, a huge fortification was built with several royal palaces and a number of churches. After Emperor Johannes, the son of Phasaelidas, followed a grandson, Iyasu I, who had a two-story palace built here. Here too is a tall domed main hall used mainly for formal events. The emperor's living quarters were far smaller. Dawit III, a son of Emperor Iyasu, had his palace built in the north of Fazil Gabi, protected by a 900 meter long wall. Lions were kept in cages. And even the archive is like a small castle. Art and culture made Gondar the religious center of Ethiopia. The former Turkish baths are now in ruins, but they were very much in evidence at that time and no doubt gave much comfort to those who used them. Under Emperor Bakafa, Imperial power was consolidated for the last time. He too had a palace built within the Fazil Gebi. A final flowering of courtly power began at the end of the 17th century and attracted merchants from Europe, the Middle East and the Arabian Peninsula. Just outside the center of the city, a sturdy wall surrounds a garden planted with trees at the center of which is a castle and a moat, the bathroom of Phasaelidas. It was situated in the middle of a large water basin in which the emperor bathed. On a hill in the town, Emperor Iyasu I had the Debri Birhan Selassie built, the monastery of the Holy Trinity on the Mountain of Light. The church was built according to the unusual religious form of a long-drawn Axumite basilica. Simple images of Jesus, the Holy Trinity and Our Lady decorate the external gallery. Wonderful murals adorn the interior. 
and the heads of angels on the ceiling bring to mind the souls of the beheaded. On another hill is the complex of Kusquam, well protected beyond sturdy walls, with the Debre Tsihai Church and the Empress Palace. Stored in a small adjoining building are the last memories of those bygone times and the remains of the Empress and her son. Set in a magnificent location overlooking the city, the palace ruins stimulate the imagination as to how splendid this all once was. It was also here that Empress Mentuwab once resided when life in Fazil Gebe became perilous. Finally, the empire disintegrated into warring principalities, a fact that spelled the inevitable decline of the capital city of Gondar. What once was a laborious route to the north of the country is now much easier, from an aircraft flying above the vast Simeon Mountains. There's a bizarre world of incredible mountain canyons, mesas and cliffs. The mountains end abruptly in the north and become hill country. Soon, the aircraft touches down. At a modern airport that meets the needs of increasing tourism. Historic Aksum was once the capital of a mighty kingdom. On the site of two previous religious buildings, this ancient cathedral was rebuilt in 1665. Thrones constructed of stone have witnessed the coronation of various monarchs whose Ethiopian Orthodox faith from the 5th century on spread far and wide. From the Eastern Roman Empire, fleeing missionaries known as Monophysites introduced the ancient Christian faith which taught that Christ had only one divine nature. Eventually, the concept of a division of faith came into being and Ethiopian Christianity developed independently. An enigma lies within a small chapel next to the cathedral. Here, a monk is said to protect the Ark of the Covenant, believed to contain the tables of the Ten Commandments which God gave to Moses. Aksum is also referred to as Ethiopian Rome, capital of the oldest Christian kingdom in the world and largest outside the Roman Empire. The new cathedral was established in 1965 under Haile Selassie I, the last emperor of the Solomonian dynasty. It is one of Ethiopia's few religious buildings in which people gather to celebrate mass, which lasts for several hours. In the new cathedral, a 600-year-old Bible forms part of its well-preserved treasures. Here, too, are colorful paintings of martyrs and of the Virgin Mary with the child Jesus. Around the huge church building, there are always a large number of believers. The ruins of Aksum are dominated by around 130 stelas. Obelisk-like monoliths of trachyte, a splendid sight. Others lie in pieces on the ground. The stelas of the Aksumite culture were created from natural stone from which numerous grave sites were marked out. The idea of the grave as being the house of the dead led to the decoration of the stelas as a kind of living room. Thus arose the story stella. At the base of the collapsed stella tomb, entrances have been exposed on both sides. Only a few of the underground grave chambers are open to the public. Mm -hmm. 
On today's western periphery of Dongur lies the ruins of a relatively modest complex, popularly known as the Palace of the Queen of Sheba. The Queen visited King Solomon in Jerusalem, who impregnated her and later son Menelik carried off the holy federal charge to Aksum. Next to the palace are the remains of the Gwurit Stele field, which is named after the queen, who is said to have destroyed Aksum. In the north, the large water basins of Mei Shum are called the Baths of the Queen of Saba. They date back to Aksumitic times and have been frequently renovated. On the hill above the town are the underground grave chambers of King Kalib and Gebre Maskal. Although little remains of the former capital of the Aksumitic Kingdom, Ethiopia's holiest site, it continues to be a place of mystery and legend. Now along the historic route back to the south, our flight passes above the foothills of the Seaman Mountains and to the Danakil Plain. Again, an airport in the middle of nowhere. So our approach to the next destination becomes an adventure. In the mountainous highlands of Ethiopia, there's an extraordinary treasure of the history of mankind. The 11 rock churches of Laribela. In the 13th century, the famous Amhara sovereign Lali Bela decided to establish a new Jerusalem in his kingdom. Unique in their construction, the rock churches are among the most little-known miracles of the world, well disguised in the red, tough rock. The World Redeemer Church of the House of the Holy Saviour is situated at the highest point of the steep Lasta Mountains. These monolith churches were completely carved out of the rock. First, the outer contours were defined by way of ditches. Then the masons worked on both the external and interior design, from floor to ceiling, domes, windows, doors and pillars gradually developed. Even today, pilgrims and visitors are deeply touched by their unusual atmosphere. Lalibela was the most important king of the Zakwe dynasty, in whose honor the old capital of Roha, located in the secluded mountains, was named. When a boy, Lalibela was chosen by a swarm of bees to be king. The colony gently enshrouded him like a cloud, a heavenly sign. Separated by tunnels and walls, two smaller rock churches follow, Bete de Brasina and Bete Golgotha. Both look like one. The external pathways are narrow and difficult to negotiate, and in each small niche live priests and monks who tend to the churches. The route leads back to the surface, down the mountain and passes the traditional village of bee huts. Next, and seen from above, the most beautiful church of all in the form of a Greek cross, Bete Georgia, consecrated to St. George. Isolated from the other churches, it lies hidden in a deep shaft. According to a legend in New Jerusalem, the valley of the River Jordan was designed to separate the two groups of churches. The double church of Gabriel and Raphael 
belongs to the second group. Again, red tufa corridors and bridges lead to the holy places. At first, from a corridor, only the facade is visible because the churches are hidden within the rock. Inside is a small central area. Winding and narrow, the route ascends and soon enters a higher world. From here, Bete Emmanuel is seen in all of its glory, as well as the unique design of the famous churches of Laribela. Again, narrow paths lead to the next church. It lies at the deepest point of the group. For more than a generation, many skillful stonemasons from Jerusalem and Alexandria carved out this eighth wonder of the world from the volcanic rock of the plateau. From La Libella, back in a westerly direction, the starting point of the historic route to Lake Tana, which lies 1,800 meters above sea level. The Bahia Da Airport is central to this region on the southern edge of the lake. On bumpy roads, we drive to the final highlight of our journey. A small ferry takes us over the narrow Blue Nile that flows out of Lake Tana. On the other side of the river, a path leads over desolate lava rock, along the Abay, as the Blue Nile here is still known. Cattle herds collect here several times a day for water. The massive volume of water of the Blue Nile Falls once almost completely disappeared from here altogether. This was due to the construction of a hydroelectric plant. Only during a temporary switch-off can a fascinating picture of an endless wall of water be seen again. The Blue Nile, one of the four paradise streams. In a large bow, it flows down from the Ethiopian highlands to Sudan and finally unites in Khartoum with the White Nile. Bahir Da is the main town on Lake Tana, and in contrast to the barren highlands, is extremely green. This fast-growing city developed from the 16th century, and is now the administrative center of the entire region. The statue of an Ethiopian warrior decorates a central circle of traffic. And two beautiful tree-lined avenues divide the city on the large lake. It's a hive of activity from dawn till dusk. The market also pulsates with life. Here, all the necessities of life can be bought, even if they are sold amid the dust of the road. On the outskirts is the traditional livestock market in which both goats and cows change hands. A huge war memorial commemorates those who lost their lives in the struggle against the dirk The peaceful atmosphere of Lake Tana marks the end of the historic route through the north of Ethiopia.